welcome to India Today, India Tomorrow, this special show where we bring you a slice of life by cutting across generations. And today we are joined by another special pairing. Please welcome Gul Panag, actor, entrepreneur, certified pilot and a multitasker and her father, General H.S. Panag, one of the most distinguished army officers and now an author as well. Appreciate both of you joining me here on India Today, India Tomorrow. I must ask you, what is it about army children and glamour? A couple of weeks ago, I had Swara Bhaskar and uh, Commodore Uday Bhaskar, again a, a Navy commander and his actor daughter, now another pairing. And I can go on and on, the Anushka Sharmas, Priyanka Chopras. What is it about film acting and glamour? I think it's, uh, it's armed forces, children and everywhere, including but not limited to the media industry. I mean, there's so many folks who are your colleagues and contemporaries who are from the armed forces background. Uh, notorious ones at that. All army brats. All army. So brat yes. is, an act is an acronym for being relocated all the time. Huh. And I think it's, the, it's the, the fact that we are being relocated all the time that, that instills in us the ability to thrive wherever we are and adapt and adjust and conquer. Because I read, you know, you went to what, 14 schools? 14 schools, yes. 14 schools over uh, what, over 12 years? Over 12 years of schooling, yes. Wow. Does that make them actually, General Panag, a little more hardy, tougher? Do you believe your daughter or indeed army children are just a little bit more tougher or is that a I think they are, they are definitely more tougher than uh, common folks. And the very fact that they have to adapt to a new environment every year and a half, two years, itself is a great challenge and a great learning process. You know, I'm, I'm just wondering though, did you ever think that maybe your daughter should join the army? Because you've been a great advocate of equal role for men and women in the armed forces. You've written about it as well. Do you think Gul could have joined the army? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, in fact, uh, I gave her the option that she can join the army. I think the inhibiting factor was at that time, uh, it was only a short service commission. And it was restricted to certain arms and uh, services. And she was very keen that since she had, uh, since I was from the mechanized infantry, that she should join the mechanized infantry. Or she thought she can join special forces. But since uh, the women were not permitted, and it was only a short service uh, kind of a commission. So that's what was the inhibiting factor. You wanted to actually join the armed forces? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to be G.I. Jane. Uh, you know, I, I really did. When I, was, uh, when I was about 17, 18, it was a very, very uh, strong desire in me to come back to the armed forces and be the fourth generation back. But uh, like Dad said, short, short service and not being able to be in, in mechanized forces. I mean, for me, that's, uh, it's, it's not being in the army at all. In all know, due respect. She would have been fourth generation. You're a family of army officers. Uh, do you think gender parity is at all possible in the army? Is it actually possible that tomorrow we'll have full uh, I th I gender think parity? It, I think it is possible. Uh, the only thing is that, and the onus for that is on our women. Uh, you know, uh, is that uh, they have to measure up to the uh, physical fitness standard, to standards to withstand the rigors of military life. So, so long as they can do that and cope up, uh, I think uh, it's just a matter of time before they are actually inducted into combat. The macho uh, men, male military officers will agree to have women, so for there's, example, there's, in combat there, roles. There is really no choice, and there is enough. A, a president's existing in the, in a, in this um, erstwhile USSR the women played a very stellar role uh, during Second World War their best snipers were women and all part of uh, combat units so I see no reason why the same thing should not happen in India and yet the 17 and 18 year old potential uh, army officer eventually becomes a Miss India in 1999 and like all Miss Indias you go into cinema because it's low hanging fruit Rajdeep you see it's really low hanging fruit and today as I look back over the last you know 20 odd years I realized that um, it was always a means to an end the idea was to be able to get a platform and pursue all the different goals that I have over the years pursued and because it's low hanging fruit it's the easiest thing to do once you're Miss India. I mean, you already somewhat recognized uh, and back in the, the day, it was a big deal. You know, because it, it, Miss Indias have had a mixed track record yes. in, in Bollywood. Do you think it's a, it's a boon to be Miss India and then enter Bollywood? Or do you think it's actually a bit of a bane? I think both. Uh, it's, there's a boon because you are, you are somewhat recognizable. So from the producer's point of view, it makes sense to cast somebody who's a newcomer, but yet known, but you can pay like a newcomer. So it's a win-win for the producer. Uh, from, from the actor's perspective, I think you have to shed the baggage of, oh, because she's a Miss India, she can't act. 
and it's taken a lot of effort for a lot of my my uh, my predecessors and successors to actually shed that image but some of them have been stellar actors uh, i mean sushmita's recent outing has again ending actor um Aishwarya also has won laurels for her acting performances, as have people like Lara and Priyanka. So I, I don't think that it's an inhibiting factor to um, you know beyond a point. But yes, you have to you have to sort of work a little harder to convince people that we can act. Here's your daughter who suddenly becomes Miss India and then goes to cinema in the world of glamour, far away from the armed forces and the battalions that you are sort of at the foothills of uh, Kargil and other places fighting. Uh, were you sort of stunned or? Did you take it as part par for the course? Actually, I was very very certain that, uh, like uh, the kind of personality that she had evolved into by the time she was twenty and when she became Miss India, I was very certain that she'll keep evolving. I had absolutely no doubt. So I I sent her a small advice, uh, you know, in form from of uh, uh, from from I was Achha, from Batalik. You I were posted all up Batalik there in Batalik. Yes. Letters from Batalik. So I wrote there. I said uh, you have. Uh, you have been parachuted into uh, into a kind of life, uh, you know, by your luck and your grit and your and your own performance. I said, now you have to keep in mind a few things. So I said, I gave her a sort of mantra of F C square I. F stood for focus. Okay. Remain focused on whatever you want to do. I intellect. No matter what you are, you will be the biggest actor, the greatest actor. But if your intellect is not sharp, you will be a nobody. P, physical fitness. In the kind of world you are going to be in, what matters is 20 years hence, and now it's 21 years. Are you going to be that fit? And I think she has achieved that. Then first C was character. Here more in relation to morals. I said you can lose your character at home, and you cannot lose it in in in, in the in the wild wild you know world or wherever you are. Then uh, second C was communication skills. If you don't have communication skills, again you lose out. You have to constantly evolve yourself and be at it. And then was I? I was initiative. Initiative means be an initiator and don't don't react to things. And before it's too late, rather, oh, I have not done well in my in my, in my movies. I said by the time the movie phase is over, you should be on to the next phase. Initiative all the time. Wow, she's taking you. You've taken his very, very sane advice seriously. But you right? know, you're I, remarkably it's... fit. You know, you have a health and fitness uh, website or a, a business yes. as an entrepreneur. You've done, as I said, Formula E racing, or you've tried it, uh, horse riding, pilot. So it it was very much General and, and Saab's also advice. Studying, I've been pursuing. I first finished my graduation, then my ma then my masters, then I pursued. I mean, of course, flying does involve a lot of studies. Yes. And now I'm in the middle of pursuing another degree that I can't speak about at this stage. Even while uh, you know welcoming motherhood to an yes, half year yes. old. Yes. Yes. So I think the the ability to constantly learn more is is from that fifty square I. The intellect has to be sharpened constantly through, of course, not just. Studies and diplomas and degrees, but being aware that there is so much to learn and, and read. And, and what is it that makes you happiest? I mean, out of all these things that you do, is it flying a plane? Is it uh, horse riding? Is it uh, driving fast cars? Biking? I've seen you in TV serials doing biking, among other things. I think being around people and communicating with people. I think I've I've been thinking about that a lot of late, and I'm I'm trying to identify what am I good at and what do I really enjoy doing. And I think. I would say communicating with people, being with people, is something that gives me um, immense happiness. You know, because of all these things that you've done, the one perhaps that got again noticed was when you became a politician. You contested an election in 2014, <laughs> Lok yes. Sabha election, Gul Panag versus Kiran Kher in Chandigarh. And Pawan the, Bansal at that. Yes, yes, from the Aam Aadmi Party. Yes. I mean, was that an experiment? You was that an experiment? No. Or was that some a commitment? Do you regret what you did? Absolutely not. So for two things, one because I was very clear. I mean, okay, let me sort of since it's a large part of who I am today is shaped by my father. We've been discussing current affairs and politics on the dinner table ever since I can remember, and I try to remember before we came here. Um, the first real national issue that. That we discussed threadbare on the dining table was the Mandal Commission, and I was uh, ten at the time, ten or eleven at the time, and I, you know, asked my father to explain to me what is going on, why are, uh, why are these, you know, students burning buses, and in fact, even in themselves. 
So uh, I think for us the dining table has always been an area for debate and discussion. And as you debate and discuss, you begin to say there are some things that are not quite right. And then I didn't want to be constantly an armchair critic who says, you know, this is not good. This is not this is not how it should be. And I wanted to be part of the solution. And I think um, the ARP, uh, from its ideological standpoint, is a party committed to trying to change the way politics is done. And that's what drew me to the ARP. You know, I, I'm just wondering, therefore, General Saab, you're the political mind is it, who, drove, uh, who drove the daughter into contesting an election. You also joined the AAP yes. uh, and I, then I, left it a few years ago. I joined the AAP uh, in 2013 primarily uh, just to, to, one is to, we keep criticizing the politicians and you know, people who govern us. I said, let's, let's be there and let's be part of it to see what it's all about and can we, can we contribute towards it. And at my age, I thought that I would be contributing towards their, you know, their stance on national security, etc. But over a period of time, I found, one, that uh, our political parties are not interested in these issues. For them, it is gen it's basically politics and influencing people that's more important. Winning elections. Yes, winning elections. And they are not interested in national security or what's happening to the armed forces or reforms thereof. So I could make little contribution. And since I was not into that part of it to, 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 to either I had no thirst for power. I had been an army commander and once you're an army commander, you hardly want to be an MLA or an MP for that matter. Not that there's anything wrong with it. So uh, eventually I found that I had uh, little to contribute. Then since I couldn't be active, so I disassociated myself about two years back. So, so has the idealism gone? Are you still a member of the Amadmi so party or has the idealism over the years, like with many others, been diluted? So I remain a member um, and uh, I, I still fundamentally believe the party carries much less, lesser baggage than any other party. And the ability f to course correct is much more than any other party right now. And uh, I do believe that uh, the potential in the short term and the medium term is is a lot. We, there is a there is a huge lacuna in our political discourse and uh, political playing field for an alternative party for somebody who does the things differently. Now, whether you can do that with uh, considering that tools with which you can fight back are being systematically destroyed. Uh, is, is something that remains to be seen. So will, will you contest another election? Absolutely. Will I see Gulk Panag Absolutely. versus Kiron Kher again? Uh, that I don't know, but you will definitely see me contesting. Okay, that's interesting. Let's take a break at this. General Saab, you've said you've left politics in a way, at least electoral politics, so left the Aam Army Party. But you know, I was reading your very fine book that you've written on the Indian Army and you are a general with very strong political thoughts. I've seen it in your tweets, in your, in your articles. You, for example, believe the army should not be politicized. A serving uh, army officer cannot have political alignments. You're against this neo-nationalism. In the book, you interestingly also speak about strongly against uh, the army tying a, a Kashmiri to the jeep, an incident that got a lot of publicity. Do you feel in some way that army officers must express their political views even while not having political alignments? Is that possible? I think this is the dilemma faced by almost all armed forces all over the world. In fact, uh, in America also, there's a raging debate. And people say that how can a army officer who till yesterday was a political and today has suddenly been catapulted uh, to uh, to be, uh, you know, to be a senior uh, sort of... Uh, no, no, we've had General V.K. Singh, who yes, uh, yes. army chief became no, no, a minister. Saying, I'm coming to that. So now he, so it happens all the time. I mean, General Eisenhower, I yes. mean, he just finished uh, his military assignment and was straightway became a, a, a Republican candidate. So it's been happening. So this debate is always there. I think you can separate the two things out. After all, we all vote. Even in the armed forces, we vote. You have your preferences. You can vote for a communist. You can vote for anybody. But you don't express it because you are supposed to give an impartial advice to the government in power. If you start identifying while in service with ideologies or with a particular political line, then your advice will become colored. And this is the biggest danger of an, a military getting politicized. Otherwise, once your job is over there, you had your inclinations, which were kept dormant because of the rules, regulations and the requirement of service. And now that you're out of it, you should you should make a contribution. You know, because you have strong views, you know, whether it's the militarization of Kashmir, whether now it's in the context of China and how India is handling the border conflict. Every time I read you, I say, you know, general has a mind of his own. Well, I think what one should, uh, what what we all happen is that military, all, militaries always tend to be sure. 
dithering here and there. Mm. I mean, you just see what's in the news that we have gone and secured some feature, they came and just... It's very simple. If you ask me, we had to do a quid pro quo. In, and this is the China uh, against uh, China. Uh, yes. And we have done it. So if you have to say it, say it like that, that it was a requirement, we had to secure and we have just gone up to the area which we had not secured, uh, we had not been up until 62. This is our area and we have now gone and sat there. So we have gone and sat on the whole of Kailash range, not only at Blacktop, but over the Spangur Gap and right up to Rishinla. So it's an excellent thing. So, no, say but so. How, many, how many generals will say that the militarization of Kashmir is something that troubles you? Yeah, it troubles us because there is no there is no military solution for any insurgency. There is a steamroller solution. Okay, Sri, Sri Lanka has done it. Maybe it's at some other places it has been done, but can a democracy like ours with our culture and traditions would we like to be a steamroller? And steamroller for, for on behalf of the government, I don't think so, that is right. I, I can see what those dinner table conversations were like. You and your brother who's a, who's a lawyer, I think both of you were in a way influenced deeply by your father more than your Absolute, mother. Absolutely. Well, I, I think my mother also in a very large part, I think our emotional, uh, our EQ is largely shaped by our mother uh, because I think how your emotional responses to situations are equally important if not your intellectual uh, and your, your intelligent responses I suppose but I think um, so uh, even on sh issues like this you know there is there's a constant disagreement I mean as far as the as far as uh, foreign policy and, and military matters are concerned I'm slightly right of center uh, and my father is you know has, has slightly different views and, and we'd be encouraged to have these views uh, Rajdeep and about role modelship both Sherbi and I have been lucky that we've never had to look outside for a role model because we've had a father who's an intellectual giant and uh, who, who doesn't just uh, tell you things, he just sort of, he's always taught by example. When he taught us things like honesty, integrity, propriety, he is living that life. Um, one of the reasons that he's able to call a spade a spade uh, throughout his career and yet right, rise to the top is because he was scrupulously honest. And that's a, uh, in every which way, from a, from a propriety standpoint, from an integrity standpoint. No, he was demonstrating what it is like to be that way. He wasn't telling us be honest, but not being honest on the side. And he encouraged debate fully. He, All I the mean, time. Uh, you, you could be a dissenter, right? We could. You yes, didn't have something to follow, that's not quite popular have, in India. But you didn't right have now. to follow General <laughs> Saab. You didn't have to no, say. No, we didn't have to. We didn't have to. In fact, on Twitter itself, I think some people, uh, my, my, my friends on the right side, take great pleasure in pointing father and daughter. Oh, daughter thinks this and father thinks this. And the thing is, you know, we are two individuals who may have the same... Um, DNA, but out the viewpoint uh, on, on certain issues can, can slightly diverge and yeah. we've always been encouraged to have a distinct viewpoint. Because you know what we are missing in the world today is nuance. You know everything is black and white. Yeah, you absolutely. know uh, whatever view you take you have to tell us are you with us or with them. Does that trouble you uh, General because you are on Twitter and Twitter is a medium which is thrives on black and white polarities. So nuance gets missing. I mean, not too many generals will be on Twitter as aggressively as you are. I look forward to your tweets. Well, I, I, I am very active on social media. I think, in fact, uh, social media taught me how to uh, interact with the public. Till then, I was leading a cocoon life. Till, till, uh, till, I, till 2009, August, in fact. She put me on to uh, Twitter. Ah. I, was, <laughs> I was leading a cocoon life. Military, I knew military and well and everything and all, sheltered life and we had hardly interacted with anybody outside. In fact, I had never really been to the market as such because that job was done by my wife. <laughs> so now when I started interacting on social media and I interacted with a whole lot of people, you know, and then, I, then I, I became very comfortable with what I was discussing. And then my pet refrains, of course, dissent. I mean, the f army also, dissent is not offense. We agree to disagree. So I learned all that. And I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. In fact, I think uh, it has made my personality grow. Social media made my personality grow. In fact, social media put me onto writing. So he's reinvented simplif himself. Simplify, also reinvented. But you know, I must tell you here, how much resistance to the idea of writing, Rajdeep? How much resistance? No, I don't want to write. I don't have time. And I was like, you're retired. What do you mean you don't have time? No, but I, I get the sense this is a family which believes in reinvention. I mean, you're, you know, you're married to a pilot. 
uh, but you're a certified pilot yourself so you you've taken the time off over the years to do lots of things with life do you believe that's the way you keep yourself energized by constantly reinventing whether as a writer and author or whether in different roles as you do i think as an individual if you don't grow and again this is a very different line spoken as a you know as somebody who's been around 20 years and what i spoke as a miss india that oh it's very important to grow and it's uh, it's it's important to keep evolving but i can actually look back today and 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 acknowledge the importance of that growth because you've got to pursue your goals you've got to have goals so evolving is is a by product of having goals and chasing those goals otherwise the dreams just remain dreams so i don't see it as evolution i just see it as goal setting and then going out there and systematically chasing your goals and those goals then you know turn into many other things because you know there was a stereotype of miss india when they were asked who's your role model they said mother teresa ah <laughs> <laughs> you said it before i did good yes. but, so you but must have been told her yes a punch line yes a punch line for miss india contest yes what was, was it again given, given by dad by ha what was that i am an incredible optimist for me every day is a new challenge something ah. more to be done something new to be achieved oh so that was the one line that made you miss india it's because every day is a challenge i mean the day you think you have it made is when something comes and slaps you in the face sure so if you see it as a challenge life just becomes that much more interesting and exciting because you know talking of reinvention just a few weeks ago i saw you in a wonderful amazon series uh, patal lok where you're playing the wife of the police officer and you were great so i'm just wondering whether ott platforms will give a new lease of life to maybe actors like you who don't want to do traditional bollywood cinema who can't dance around trees <laughs> absolutely i think now there's there's a the parameters within which filmmakers had to operate have really been widened because you can reach a certain kind of an audience which is now tested and tried and metriced and cataloged and analyzed through fancy uh, tools that these these uh, these otts have and also because i think um there is there is now casting which is perhaps unique that could be attempted which earlier couldn't be attempted because of commercial pressure one and two the last year and a half has been really busy for me as an actor i had a show that came out on um, on um, on amazon again called family man where i played an army officer uh, a gangster and something in, in on z and then i did another show um Uh, Kapavan and Pooja so I played very glamorous powerful female characters over the last year and this uh, particular character was a huge departure from what I would normally be perceived as and uh, that's why I was incredibly drawn to Renu's character a very supporting part but I thought it was completely unlike what I had played in, in recent times yeah I I love the raw energy of Patal Lok and I'm I'm just wondering as we conclude reinvention uh, since we are talking how are you going to now reinvent yourself uh, Now that you've got your book in place, you've been writing away. You're sitting on the farmhouse occasionally. When I call you on a TV show, you say, "I'm on the farmhouse." So you're away from the world and yet part of it. What next, uh, General? I think, uh, Rajdeep, what is left is uh, is is what you are doing. Uh, you have got such a reach to the people. I think I wish I was more active. Uh, you want to be a TV anchor? <laughs> well, why not? Yeah, uh, you you want to sort of. Uh, navigate a debate between an indian and pakistani general where they are shouting at each exactly. other exactly why a more nuanced debate no shouting nothing required a more challenging debate to to us pe trp nahi milegi general saab trp comes from shouting <laughs> 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 But it's, it's a, no, no, it's really not. Really okay. not. I, I don't think so. You I, believe I people think, want intelligent yes, conversation? Yes, I think if there is substance in what we discuss and what we talk, uh, it will get it will get wide coverage. I have no doubt about that. How are you going to reinvent yourself? What next? I think uh, some more studies are on the corner for me, uh, and once I wrap those, then there will probably be a, a sort of a big reinvention. Right now, there's some you know a lot of work on the acting front, but uh, I hear you want to learn how to play golf. Yes, golf is on the cards. My father's biggest regret is you never pursued a sport competitively. So I said, okay, you know, there's people's people start golf at all kinds of ages, and maybe I can become good enough uh, to perhaps compete. No, right? Yeah. If she had the potential to do well in number of sports, she was a great swimmer. She was uh, a, a good athlete. Then, uh, I mean, she's done adventure sports, but she never took up any any game as a challenge. the so one game which i feel that uh -huh. at her age now she can still take up is golf and ladies golf has got phenomenal scope and she still has the physique she's got everything and she can if she focuses on it she can 
at be in competitive golf in about six months to one year's time. My God, wow. you're really, you're really <laughs> setting tough goals for your daughter, you know. No, it's not one really. thing for an army man to play golf with his little kota by the side and yes. enjoy. Her, no, know. no, it is achievable goal. So let's see. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's around goal. the corner. Let's see. Okay. Well, one thing is clear that here is a father who keeps setting new and newer and newer goals for his daughter, many of which you fulfil. So, uh, well, yes, you know, India, India tomorrow is talking to India today. Uh, well, it's been wonderful talking to both of you because clearly this is a very special relationship that father and daughter share. Thank you so much for joining me here on the show today. That's it on the special show. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hi everyone, Preeti Chaudhary here. Hope you like this video. For latest news and analysis, like and subscribe to the India Today YouTube channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon to stay updated. Thank you for watching.